Wow. the opportunity also and then after that to um, to uh, get these questions to to Pia and Natasha um, just to give also a bit of context to the people that are sitting here I mean Pio obviously um, is uh, pretty clear he's the artist here in the show so um, I don't think that needs a lot of uh, explanation and um, uh, Pio came with a nice suggestion, um, which was to invite Natasha Ginwala. Um, so welcome uh, uh, here in uh, CCA, um, and and to have a conversation, really. And um, Natasha uh, is um, a curator that uh, uh, moves around Europe, if I can say it like that, <laughs> um, and is involved. Um, um, Biennial called uh, Contour Biennial, which I think is the eighth edition, no, Natasha? That she's doing in, in Belgium, <coughs> um, and also a curatorial advisor for the next and upcoming documenta, um, amongst a long uh, list of other activities. Um, and um, we really grabbed the opportunity f uh, to, uh, to get um, this conversation uh, starting uh, tonight, and I'm uh, hoping it will be a good one. So um, I think uh, we'll see a bit of a, um, we'll do it a bit in, a, in, in, in an order of things. So we have a presentation and then afterwards um, we can come back to uh, some questions. So um, again, thank you for coming and I hope to see you next time here or online, <laughs> uh, which is also possible. So um, Pia and Natasha, thanks again also for, for being here. and. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, for me, it's a great pleasure. It's my first time in in um, in this part. I've never been to Glasgow before, and um, I've only heard about so much about the city through artist friends um, who've had the opportunity to work here at the CCA. So um, also to Pio, I'm grateful Remco and Ainsley to to bring me here. Mm. Um, I've followed. Pio's work through different exhibitions um, and also considered it um, a kind of practice that enables my own thinking um, in terms of the sort of exhibitions I work on, which are often um, kind of modes of research and investigation on certain current ideas, but also certain kind of historical lens uh, in which propositions are made um, through cultural work and 
So there was a show on corruption in which I had invited Pio and we're going to sort of discuss some mm -hmm. of these threads um, today. So it's going to be more a, an, a dialogue presentation, actually, and not, not a s sort of straightforward artist talk, because I'm going to, at some points, make comments as we move along. Um, but the idea was also to show some early work and to build on a number of um, important approaches, I feel, that have grown um, through the years from since when Theo finished studying here in, in Glasgow and then went on to do um, so many different bodies of work. And what I see also as a, as a sort of certain uh, kind of narrative building um, practices that have involved the building of characters, um, often protagonists in different spheres of power, and what it means to weave them together in a, what we were discussing today as a dramaturgy. Um, and through um, an accumulating object inventory, what does it mean to bring an object inventory, a sort of atlas um, of objects, together with protagonists in these different moments of historical rule and power, um, both uh, crossing the eastern and the western hemispheres, um, the north and the south in a sense of, as well, um, in terms of, of thinking and ideology. And so this practice feels more as a continuum of political passage, of the arcs of governance um, that pervade, that invade, um, and aspects of um, the farce of authenticity, forgery, consumption, um, and corruption as, as some things that um, we, we weave together. But so for f but first I wanted to um, invite Pio to discuss also the role of mythology and founding narratives and their symbolic resonance in some of his work. Mm. Well, first of all, thanks again for coming. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to realize this particular project at the CCA because it's sort of, it expands on so many things that I've been working on, um, probably uh, since finishing um, at the art school in 2007. Um, I know Ross is kind of, is here and I just, it made me realize at the first, the first instance that the, this kind of, in a way, this research or this scholarship on, on corruption, particularly on rooting this history of corruption and, and myth-making and image construction within a kind of sort of a very specific sort of Philippine context to begin with was something that kind of that began its roots in, in, in my dissertation, oddly enough, um, in 2007. And, and it's kind of, and in a way that this, this <laughs> in a way that this this particular show kind of expands it to a kind of to almost a breathtaking scale um, in terms of in terms of who it renders complicit to this particular kind of moment of disenchantment that we all find ourselves in um, and I guess um, the backbone of the historical research and and the kind of the practice of object object making, of of drawing, of 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 writing, um, comes from my personal kind of history and the kind of particular involvement of of myself and my family in the in the history of the Philippines and in in the recent kind of history of 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 the Marcos dictatorship. So. I think it it kind of seems important to to begin um, to begin there mm -hmm. um, as a kind of I guess as a as a way of building towards talking about the various sort of subjects that this show opens up um, and I've always kind of I've always seen this particular image as as a, a way the genesis of the way I approached my work and the way I kind of the way I unpack the kind of the personal and the political, the public and the private, the kind of absurd and the terrifying within my practice. Um, so this particular image um, 
was a photograph taken on the 25th of February 1986, which was the, um, the, the particular day when Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, who ruled the Philippines under a sort of a conjugal dictatorship for two decades, were forced out of office um, by uh, a military coup that then led to a popular uprising. Um, and in the photograph is my father on the right-hand side, or the left-hand side, depending on where you're looking, um, um, posing next to this painting. Um, and this photo is key <coughs> because it... My father was a student protester at that time, and he, he was one of the first people to access the presidential palace shortly after um, Ferdinand and Imelda were whisked away aboard one of Ronald Reagan's helicopters um, for a Hawaiian exile. And, and my, my dad kind of was one of the first people into the gates. And, and I think as a snapshot of a particular historical moment where a public institution collapses and suddenly the, the populace is, is, is given access to the kind of the sordid private life behind it, it, it's a really kind of important document of, of this episode that is repeated throughout different cities, throughout different decades, and it's a kind of a constant, in a way, it's a constant process of, of, the, pri the, of the, the, pr the public institution suddenly being made accountable. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also like, as an image, it's sort of an absurd kind of composition of this, you know, this, this painting of Ferdinand Marcos as, a, as this kind of absurdly masculine figure. Um, and it's funny because the first time I showed this image, um, which was in 2011, as, as part of the, the catalogue of my, my uh, MA show at the Royal Academy, um, it was shortly after um, the Arab Spring, and the approach, the people's approach to the image was telling in that the assumption was that these absurdly, co almost comically masculine demagogues are a thing of the past, never to return again. Um, and five years later, we're kind of subject to these, to the kind of a recycling of these characters. Um, but uh, I think I'm kind of digressing a little bit. <laughs> um, but going back to this idea of mythology mm -hmm. and myth-making, um, this particular kind of image um, of Ferdinand Marcos as this mythical creature called Malacas, which in, in Filipino means the strong one, was, uh, was it, the Marcoses kind of appropriated this creationist myth of of Ferdinand as Malacas the strong one and Imelda as Maganda the beautiful one. And in Filipino creationist folklore, Malacas and Maganda were the sort of the, the Adam and Eve of Philippine society. And the the alleged myth is they emerge from a bamboo stalk fully formed, um, naked. And it's a kind of it's an image that the Marxists had appropriated as sort of a s the central iconography of their kind of personality cult. And it's, it, it's kind of an interesting assertion of like, I guess, post-colonial independence when in reality, the Philippines was, was a kind of an American back sort of state that was allowed to exist in what, in what the Americans justified as a constitutional um, uh, autocracy, because it allowed it allowed the um, it allowed the uh, the Americans to sort of have a barrier from the sort of communist the sweep of communist governments that were taking over Southeast Asia. So you have this like this assertion of like almost like cartoonish kind of post-colonial independence amidst this sort of actual geopolitical propping of a for the services of, of a capitalist, democ capitalist democracy. Um, 
And I think all these themes, which you know, are contained within this image, kind of are explored further in the practice as 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 the work has evolved over the last five five six years. Um, and this particular kind of harnessing of of um, creationist mythology, but also the kind of the imbuing of sort of of ideology to something as natural as bamboo is something that that kind of that I'm that I'm always drawn to this kind of weaponizing of the banal <coughs> and the kind of the kind of difficulties that have arised from from that kind of strategy. Um, so over the past um, few years, I've kind of gone back to this image and kind of explored it in different ways. So from this sort of personal photograph, I've I've been creating these series of uh, reproductions of Imelda as Maganda and Ferdinand as Malakas to kind of I guess that the, the kind of own, it's a strategy to point to, to sort of talk about the fraudulence of this imagery given the sort of geopolitical reality that, that they were existing in, but also like to kind of to stage that fraudulence further. And we talk about mm. this, how dramaturgy or the sort of dram <coughs> the structure of theatricality is something that I always go back to in the work. And, and this, this sort of couple, this, this image, these two images always seem to be, in a way, they're, they've always been the protagonists in, in my kind of, in the way I've understood political narratives and in the way I've understood structures of power. And so it made sense that these characters kind of persist throughout the practice. Um, so this is an installation of, um, of, of Malakas and Maganda at Asia Art Archive in, in Hong Kong, um, which I think the curator in Tigera was more interested in the kind of weaponizing of bamboo as a kind of ideological tool, but I was interested in this sort of, in trying to find ways to make this fraudulent image even more fraudulent. So um, by kind of, I guess by playing with ideas of, of fakery and, mm -hmm. and, and so these are actually uh, fake reproductions of the original paintings, which are still, for some reason, um, displayed in the presidential palace, despite despite what happened in the last thirty years. I mean, I've asked a, a folk artist to uh, from the Philippines to replicate the painting, which is then photographed and then printed um, to, to a slightly lower resolution in in canvas. So there's a kind of cheapening mm. of this overly theatrical image. Um, and the idea is, and it's a piece that I've shown a few times, is every time it gets shown, it sort of gets slightly larger. So the resolution gets worse and the kind of, that fakery gets even more and more pronounced. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then this is another kind of, um, I guess another representation of this myth. I keep on going back to this myth as a, literally the idea of like a, a fraudulent genesis. Um, mm -hmm is crucial, this idea of like overly, overly staging a fake origin. Um, and this is actually, this is a, this is a, a piece that I showed in, um, in Manila in 2014 and it kind of, I always find it difficult to talk about this particular piece because there's so many layers of, of fraudulence that kind of involves the actual procuring of, of art objects that, um, all right, how, where do I start? Um, <coughs> so this piece kind of um, started off as a, I, I found a, a, um, a kind of sculptural representation of Malakas and Maganda on Google, um, which is this sort of gold image in the background. And, and oddly enough, it's sort of, it, it's sort of, it, it kind of, it accrued its own mythology as I got as I fell into researching on the object, and I wanted it to be uh, a kind of, in a way, like to construct a whole mythology around this this image that was almost found through serendipitous means. Um, but, uh, but as I researched on the object further, I found that it was actually a copy of a trophy that the that the Marxists had kind of used. 
um, as a kind of as something that they gave away to a lot of sort of cronies to kind of people who they've deemed of cultural importance. Um, and the the object that I've actually bought was actually a fake version of a multiple that was that was freely available th um, through certain individuals, and I managed to procure a, a version of that trophy. Um, and then it made sense to have a monumental version of 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 the the figure to kind of complete this sort of this sort of network of kind of fraudulence of this this network of the counterfeit this network of kind of 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 mythologizing through material mm -hmm. of mythologizing through repetition um and i think this 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 theme of fraudulence is something that fraudulence and genesis fraudulence and and kind of a nation building and fraudulence and and the the kind of the construction of kind of public political identities are themes that I've returned to constantly. Um, and I think as the practice evolved, it became about trying to undermine this, this kind of, these public, these fraudulent public representations by kind of going deeper into the private lives behind this facade, which I guess brings us to mm -hmm the next kind of theme, the next yeah. kind of part of the research, really. Yeah, I feel like um, the, the, what are the kinds of architectures that are opened up through the practice? I think that, that, that's, a, that's always been quite fascinating to me because it, the way you talk about how the public enters the mm. palace, for instance, there's the way that these domestic interiors um, in spaces of power are opened into and pierced into through um, through the kind of objects through the through the way that the dining room and the living room are are sort of again spaces scenographic mm. spaces very highly choreographed and, and almost two dimensional spaces yeah, yeah. yeah and and how they've 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 been um, they've been pictured in your shows and mm. also in this exhibition you have the, the the sort of portrait of the living room that is facing all of these objects that have been auctioned off and so there's this this sort of encounter um, between the regis registration of those interiors um, the kind of luxuries but also banalities that s sit side by side um, and one of the and, and I also felt that the bank, in a sense, we talked mm. about this, how the bank acts as museum storage mm. as well, because once, the, so there's so there's kind of transformation of, of the role of the bank world. It's like an archival space. <laughs> yeah, with all of these paintings and silverware mm. um, that have been sequestered from the Marcoses. Um, and so fraudulence becomes uh, a scheme of collecting. So the logic of collecting enters through the kind of chain of fraudulence that persists. Um, and I think also the idea of collecting as a sort of, again, it's, it's, it's access to mm. a, private, um, a private construction of identity that, mm -hmm. may, that may, maybe isn't necessarily readily available or like freely available, in fact. Yeah. Mm. And I think it also reveal um, in the way that the pristine becomes a multiple, there's also mm. this this kind of web of neurosis, and the way that that the the accumulation is then the arrow is turned and it mm. becomes something that is this it it sort of schizophrenically repeats, and I feel so I feel like there's a there's kind of the psychology of the mm. object and the and the protagonist are both investigated within the work. If if you want to go into um, these sets, and we can talk a bit about the yeah, auction. I think yeah, I think going back to this idea of I mean the whole conversation behind the bank happened because the after this this research on Malakas and Magenda, the this project on the Marcuses took on a a, a specific title, um, which is the collection of Jane Ryan and William Saunders. Um, Jane Ryan and William Saunders were the 
alter egos that Imelda and Ferdinand had used to open ba bank accounts in with Credit Suisse in Zurich. So this idea of, um, of the banking system becoming an enabler of, of this kind of transformation of, pri of public wealth into private money obviously is something that, mm -hmm. that we know has, has, has been happening for the last um, however many decades. But every time we're confr confronted with that reality through often a, bread a breathtaking amount of data, we always approach it like it's it's a new thing that's happened. So yeah, so this idea of this idea of like contrasting this very kind of absurdly nationalistic identity of Malakasin Maganda with the kind of the privacy of Jane Rand and William Saunders then becomes a kind of I guess a a conflict that that I kind of explore, the kind of the dichotomy of the pu private and the public, um, the kind of transformation of 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 um, public money into private wealth, and and it's it's sort of a it's um, it's something that I've exp that I've kind of tried to investigate by actually piecing together um, the collection of silverware, jewelry, um, old master paintings that the Marcuses had kind of accumulated while they were pretending to be this sort of Adam and Eve figure of Philippine um, society. And as, a, as, a, as almost as a counterpoint to their public pronouncements of self-realization, they were kind of, they were staging this sort of almost two-dimensional performance of kind of Western, uh, this Western notion of power. So, you know, they had like, um, the largest collection of Regency era silverware in in the world when it when when people discovered it and sequestered it they had this sort of this kind of almost un what's the word on indiscriminating kind of collection of of um of old masters some of them were top notch goyas and then you had you know they would there were stories of um Imel de Marcos would uh, would send an, an underling to Marlborough Gallery in London, and and you know she would say she would like a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars worth of impressionist paintings, <laughs> and <laughs> this kind of it's it's kind of a performance of collecting rather than a kind of connoisseurship, and I think that that probably is often true about a lot of collections that that kind of that exists in the world, particularly a lot, of, a lot of collections surrounding contemporary art or surrounding old masters, surrounding art in general. Um, and so I kind of, I've, I've done a series, this is an ongoing project in, in that actually a lot of, in fact, all of the works that I've, I've taken on are sort of ongoing series, sort of parallel trajectories of history that kind of, that just run continuously. So this, this series of installations, all forming part of this, part of this collection of Jane Ryan and William Saunders, I'm just going to show some images. So, um, so this image, which is taken from a Christie's auction catalog, then transforms into a kind of a, a two-dimensional museum of, of Regency era silverware. Um, and I think this idea of and I think that's kind of reflected again in, in, the, in the drawings in the show, but the idea of the auction as a site of excavating history is, is, is a running theme in, in, in the practice. But it almost like, it came into my work almost purely by serendipity because I, I literally found, I found a catalog of um, the silverware and the old master paintings that, um, that were sequestered from the Marcuses um, in '86, and then subsequently they were um, auctioned off by Christie's on behalf of the Philippine Commission and Good Government, which is the basically the Philippine version of the South African Truth Commission. So it was in charge of um, of uh, sequestering the property, um, of tracing the the networks of ill-gotten wealth, of 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 kind of working with auction houses to to sell off to sell off the works so so the kind of idea of of the auction as this site of research kind of happened almost by chance i found these catalogs online 
and it kind of sparked this interest in in the auction. I mean, particularly because, as as a visual artist working now, you can't see, you you can never escape that as a as a as a site for where work is valued, um, but also in the context of of political narratives. And we were talking earlier about the two main places where you, where people have access to to this this kind of this private collections is either immediately after a revolution or during an auction, um, and how the revolution and the auction seem like two particular sites where where people are like are given access to this you know to this kind of collapsing of 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 boundaries to reveal a sort of private self, um, and so the idea of literally just presenting the inventory within the auction catalog, but presenting them as artifacts, then kind of sparked a whole, a whole body of work, starting with, with this collection of silverware, which, which I showed at Gasworks um, in 2014. Um, but then the idea of, um, then kind of a, I sort of realized that, that beyond just presenting Presenting them as artifacts, there was also the the opportunity to somehow stage a kind of a way of returning these images to the public, uh, largely by returning them to the public consciousness. But mm -hmm. but I kind of tried to find a strategy to literally to kind of democratize this loot in a way, and it, it then evolved into this next body of work, um, which is a series of. Uh, about 200 postcards of the old master collection that the that the Marxists had amassed. So it it's kind of a crazy collection. It, you know, they they had they had a Raphael which ended up being bought by the Uffizi Gallery. They had um, El Greco's, but they also had a strange collection of like Arcadian um, sort of pastoral oil paintings that that are of no aesthetic value, but presumably they were also bought as a job lot at some point. But for me, and also like this is a this is an installation in Sydney. But I showed this piece first in in the Philippines, in Manila, and and I realized that all of these the Marcos loot had existed largely as a singular thing, as ill-gotten wealth. But but the idea of of the inventory, the idea of like of how astonishingly varied it was. Was something that has somehow like been abstracted, so people didn't really have any sense of of the extent of it. So, for a lot of people, particularly people in my generation, this was the this installation was the first time they were actually privy to to the extent of of the collection, um, and it made it more important that then it it was then. The information was then physically redistributed mm -hmm. to to the public, so they they're 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 actually they're postcards that people are can then take away. Um, I wanted to interject here and just talk about this installation because I I feel that what was al what's also been special and in, in in working with you has been to to think about because a lot of the works are have this seriality and this indefinite mm. kind of arrow in which they pursue these topics and, and gather um, more and more evidence. Mm. Um, and so for me, it was quite important to be in discussion with the work, but then also think about how the display conditions and environment mm. can shift. Mm. And so, um, for instance, in the show that we did, um, in New York at Eflux, um, which was called Corruption, Everybody Knows, and was a very large um, show, which also had a lot of, um, had this components of uh, essays that were shown with the artistic work. Um, and we, we put these uh, postcards onto carousels. Carousel, yeah. um, and and it, was, it was quite wonderful to see how, how they could become, you know, they could be like, other sort of tourist uh, posters to be to be mm. taken away, but it really worked within the climate of that <coughs> exhibition. Um, and to me, uh, this series particularly, um, it it also talks about um, 
the way that the question of loot, the idea of loot, um, is something that is always made portable. It's in mm. in this in yeah. the way that you know these postcards are made portable, and you start to recall that these paintings, priceless works, were just some put away <laughs> some of them in into into suitcases. Mm. Yeah. In, and, and this is how some of the most ancient, um, uh, even sacred work um, from various sites in, 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 in the colonized world have been, have been broken off, taken away, and, mm. and, and, and kind of in, made into transportable objects that then create a certain identity for the Western sort of colonizer, mm. Mm, in a yeah. sense, um, for them to build their, construct their identities on it. And I, yeah, sort of appreciate the way that this work has mm. traveled. Yeah, I think in a way this work has kind of traveled the most, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this idea of the inventory as well, and you, you mentioned evidence, and, and I think there's always, wh when, whenever I, I kind of conceive of a show, there's always an element of it that is just this kind of, this breathtaking array of things. Um, and I think that goes back to, I guess, this trying to, to kind of present things in, in a forensic manner. Like the idea of the inventory as an appeal to something incontrovertible um, is, is something that has been really important, particularly in, in, in kind of literally having the kind of absurd but unwanted privilege of being able, be, of showing this Marcos loot to uh, the public for the first time in, in all its, in all its kind of astonish, it's in, in all its variety. Um, and especially like, you know, it, it, this, this, this idea of us existing in, in a kind of, in a political context now that, that is post truth or, you know, that it's, it's, it's a phrase that is being thrown around now. Um, but and the only way that you can counter that is, is with 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 this, with a kind of inventory, really, with an inventory of facts, uh, with kind of an inventory of data, or, you know. So, so that kind of, in a way, like I keep on this this piece in particular is is something I feel that has been really important to me because it it kind of communicates all of these things, this this kind of this uh, this appeal to evidence mm -hmm. as. But I. I, I feel a bit like I need to say maybe something that's slightly contradictory in okay. terms of how you're talking about data, because mm. even in this series, and I think we could kind of go into that line of thinking, which is the fact that your work is not purely about staging data, because no. that would be something else. Mm. And like w the way we started out, it's it's a lot to do away, with yeah. narrative and narrative formation that is quite playful mm. that can also be irreverent that can also be slippery mm. and 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 there is the case of the narrative form of interpretation and so mm -hmm. in terms of evidence there is interpretation right and that mm -hmm. that, but that always is there, yeah, yeah. There, that's always there but in the way that the even like here i think there's do we have the text yeah yes yeah, so i think mm -hmm. this text is I'm just going to read it. Um, it's from an art news magazine in October 1990. Investigators say that as just as the Marcos government was toppling, someone or some group emptied the 60th Street townhouse, the Olympic Towers apartment and other Marcos residences of much of their valuable contents before the properties were seized. Nothing on the record indicates where the 38 paintings Khashoggi, who is a, a, a Saudi arms dealer that, that became complicit in the, the transport of these works out of New York and out of Manila, um, the 38 paintings bought, Khashoggi bought were kept during the interim, but investigators did pick up their trace in the person of Khashoggi, sometime Manhattan chauffeur, chauffeur Ernest Sabatino. On May 19, 1986, Sabatino testified he got a call from a Khashoggi aide who told him to rent a small truck and wait for a call from someone named Irene. Something had to be delivered to Khashoggi's private plane, a Boeing 727, then parked at the Butler Aviation Terminal at Newark Airport. Irene, Irene called Sabatino, Irene called Sabatino continued, and he was told to drive to a mall in Douglaston, Queens, and turn the truck over to two men while he waited at a parking lot. When the two men returned with the truck, he was to drive it to Khashoggi's plane. Everything went according to plan, said Sabatino, adding that he never learned the identity of the men <coughs> nor the contents of the truck. 
When the men asked him to sign a receipt, what looked like names and titles, said Sabatino, he refused. I didn't load the truck, he said. The two men told him not to worry about it, Sabatino continued. So I just signed Mickey Mouse. You signed Mickey Mouse? Roared Judge F. Keenan in astonishment when he heard the testimony. I literally signed Mickey Mouse, Sabatino replied, adding that on his way to New York Airport, he had parked the truck unattended on a Manhattan side street where he stopped to get some Chinese food. <coughs> but even the playfulness yeah. is there is a yeah, kind of, it's, mm. it's it's kind of it's there is the the, the ref the, hmm. the idea of referring to a mm -hmm. historical text is there the yeah. stringency there that I kind of I I mean the the, the choice of the mm. phrase obviously is makes it a little bit more playful mm. but I feel like there's a stringency to sure. appealing to a kind of document yeah. no matter how ridiculous yeah. the content is yeah. and the, yeah, the document as mm. this kind of site mm. that that can you know even appear as fake fiction yeah. because of how ludicrous it is i think that that's a that's a really mm. um yeah it's, it's a wonderful quality that is it's quite it's quite hard to create and it's sort of yeah i think the crazy thing about this this project as well was because throughout this whole uh in fact not so much now because the philippine government is <laughs> uh who knows um but throughout this this whole um this whole project, I was actually working closely with the, this commission on good government, and um, and there are moments when when the information I was discovering was information that had either they'd lost in the archives or has mm. kind of been forgotten by convenience or by bureaucracy. So there was this kind of this moment when you were finding kind of information that was then kind of feeding into the actual activities that. The commission was was taking on, um, and actually, I chose this this text because shortly after I opened that project in the Philippines, which had the the Malacas and Maganda sculptures and the postcards, two months later, the Philippine Commission on Good Government actually raided the Imelda Marcos's office, which is something they hadn't done in <coughs> in decades. So I, I'm not entirely sure what. <laughs> what the role of the research there, but the, the I, I always found the timing of it um, quite peculiar. Um, um, but adding to the kind of this discussion of fraud and, and fakeness, I'm just going to read. So according to the notes of Marcos aide Ferro Jimenez, the four installments were made to the wife of an Italian art dealer, Mario Bellini Adriana. Go Gauguin's still life with Idol was reportedly acquired for one million $500, while Pissarro's work was bought for 420000 In a report dated October 9, 2014, but submitted to the Sandigan Bayan, which is the um, corruption court, on the 15th of October 2014, court officers led by Albert de la Cruz said they were not allowed by the congressional staff of Marcos to bring the paintings. They were told that clearance from the House Speaker was needed and that Congress was in recess. Furthermore, the staff insisted that the canvas used in the artworks was tarpaulin, and not the typical canvas that painters used to paint on. It turns out that the paintings that the commission were trying to sequester were digital prints on canvas that, uh, that Imelda had made copies of so she can display these paintings, which are allegedly in her own penthouse mm. in the office. And the idea of the government kind of going through this whole bureaucratic process to kind of to sequester digital prints on canvas, which are in gilt frames, is just crazy <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah <laughs> but I think yeah the kind of as I went through this research the kind of the absurdity of the facts just kept on piling up and the kind of events that followed that were kind of happening as the research was happening was just uh, yeah it was it was it yeah it was really quite bizarre mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I think so should we talk about the text yeah. you know mm -hmm. okay, so, okay. <laughs> We're leading to that. Yeah, so, le <laughs> so leading leading to th this moment um, where uh, one of the things that again just in in meeting Pio over time, I I was always surprised in in terms of I mean of course there are um, so many artists who 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 write regularly and writing maintain writing as a practice um, beside their work or around their work. Um, but I, I, I feel that when is this sort of almost investigative research um, that that you're mm. doing, Pio? And 
then is also um, the way that the essay enters the exhibition body because it isn't just writing um, for, in sometimes writing for the sake of writing mm -hmm. as, as an al kind of alternative realm of practice or so it's much more in terms of how to um, dissect but also figure parts of like establish some kind of chronology yeah and, sort of, and I was yeah. even today you were talking about how you see um, this exhibition mm. as a sort of sequence an essay yeah. sequence and I found that something important to point out. Maybe you can talk and about it. I think, that. yeah, I mean, the, the writing always kind of runs in parallel to to the show in that when I when I was preparing to uh, to do a, the show, I wrote this this text called Notes on Notes on Decomposition, which kind of, which unpacks the flow of the show, but also kind of interjects it with with quotes, with kind of, with different quotations from different historical or sort of literary texts that I, I would refer to. But I think, but the idea of like writing um, as a way of just literally making sense of, <laughs> of the kind of chronologies and the histories that, that get jammed into the, into the work is really important. But also the, the writing as a way of allowing people to have access to the breadth of research that I go through when I produce a show, there's a kind of, I think the idea of writing as an act of being quite a generous artist mm -hmm. is is important to me. I think because I think it's important that people are able to follow uh, this. I guess the kind of the flow of events, the kind of going back to this idea of dramaturgy. This mm -hmm. there's always this presentation of the cast of characters and, and the kind of you know. So that mm. kind of that that always is. I wouldn't say that the writing is the backbone of the show, but it, it definitely like it, it supports the kind of it supports the work in, in, in quite a generous way, I think. I um, mean so like I think I just wanted to go through like the different the different ways that text has kind of entered the practice, leading to the way that the text literally becomes this this wall of, of information in the show. But so from from the postcards um, um, which which had like seven different texts relating to what happened to these paintings shortly after the revolution. I kind of I was sort of started exploring different ways. So the idea of the publication as a, as something that not not just a press release, but as a kind of a historical booklet that people then can take away um, um, after they've seen the show. They can read it while they while they're um, they're in the show. But this idea that the that the installation itself is just a portal into a, this this other history, and then the the text then kind of elaborates on that on that kind of that environment mm -hmm. or that context. Um, but then, as as this kind of writing or this sometimes it's it's less writing, but it's more just combining different found texts into something coherent. I kind of made sense that for the text to be even more present in in the exhibition like so it, it isn't just a, a kind of appendix that which usually booklets or or these leaflets are treated as but it becomes like a an actual sculptural presence in the space um, and so this was the first sort of wall text that um, that I made which is for a show in Hong Kong in 2015 uh, it was a show called so South by Southeast and it's sort of it's, it kind of, it basically, it, it sort of connects the history of Southeast Asia with Southeast Europe and the kind of, the shared sort of legacy, the shared history and the shared experience of kind of, of going through the kind of political push and pull that the Cold War brought to both regions. Um, so for this show, I kind of continued on this, this collection of Jane Ryan and William Saunders. Um, and one of the weirdest things that Imelda Marcos um, bought um, when she was first lady, but also she was the she was the director of this institution that she called the Metropolitan Museum, which is sort of that same. With I think it was that she was convinced that it had that same grandeur as, as the Metropolitan Museums. It was called the Met as well, mm -hmm. um, and she bought these. Uh, 
these Croatian naive paintings on glass when she would go to behind the Iron Curtain to sort of do a charm offensive with, with the sort of communist despots. And so there's these about 250 um, Croatian naive paintings on glass that are just rotting in, in sort of in the storage of the Metropolitan Museum, which still exists. Um, and because they had literally no other context within the Philippine history apart from Imelda bought it as tokens, as, as a kind of, I guess as trinkets when she'd go on her shopping trips to, maybe they were the only thing she could purchase when she was there, I don't know. Um, I kind of, I installed the, these reproductions. Again, like I asked her, I, I, I redocumented these paintings and presented them on the same scale um, with, with the kind of frame included in the photograph. And I juxtaposed it with, um, with the, the full transcript of a YouTube clip I found from Imelda Marx's own YouTube channel. Um, uh, so the, the, this, this clip kind of narrates um, her trip to Moscow for the state funeral of Chevchenko, who was the, the Soviet leader before uh, Gorbachev. Um, and it's, it's a really strange text because it is, it is unofficial. It's, the, it's a chronicle of an official trip, but it kind of segues into sort of Hello Magazine style, like, and she wore this, and, and she shook hands with Thatcher, who came with the daughter of, and it's sort of, I, I kind of, the text was so ridiculous and so expansive, it made sense to embrace that. Mm that attitude and present it as this ridiculous expansive text and and also the kind of parade of grotesque characters in the paintings kind of mimic the parade of grotesques which you know these kind of uh, Kissinger was there and then Thatcher came and <coughs> then the, uh, the pa Pakistani Prime Minister kissed Imelda's cheek and, and Imelda Marcos was the only person to lay white orchids on the on the coffin everyone else um, lay red roses so that it's sort mm. of there's this sort of bizarre kind of romantic language um existing in this sort of like soviet austerity it was just it was strange but i think also it begins this sort of i think we were talking about this earlier this sort of the strange kind of like sometimes the works, there's there's a, there's a gap between these geographies that I refer to, mm -hmm. but I think, but but actually they do exist together. Mm -hmm. And as as absurd as they seem, like these texts kind of recognize that these these absurd characters, these ab these absurd geographies, these absurd politics do kind of. There are moments in history where they all kind of literally occupy the mm -hmm. same space, share the same oxygen. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the drawings. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, um, yeah, with the drawings, um, well, it brings us to the show, really. Yeah, it brings us to the show. And we will digress again. <laughs> um, we talked when, when discussing the show, um, and also this, this, the way that within certain kind of, um, moments in history, be that a state funeral, you see all of these uh, political characters mobilized into a sort of singular frame. And within mm, yeah. these drawings um, that you see here, again, Pierre's already thinking about how to expand the series into like double of what he managed to do. It's very painstaking work. And so we did talk about drawing as labor and, and what does it mean to labor over these objects. and I thought it was really important to think about the way that um, these objects are rendered invisible um, when they are kind of when they are looted or when they're um, they're they're taken away from their public lives into the private lives of 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 these powerful um, oligarchs or, or political um, dictators. Um, and the way that the labor of the artist in this case is to produce them back into, in, into visibility and into the, a, a certain kind of taxonomy um, of, of, of the visible as a sort of political exercise, in fact. Um, and 
how to uh, consider the role of these as sort of neurotic fetishes. Um, and, and, and some of these are also artworks and we're gonna go into mm. details of what it means to place these artworks back into, into this kind of drawing exercises and mapping exercises. Um, and also I just noticed this little detail of how there's a lot of time pieces within the collection. Um, and so you, you see these highly decorative um, kind of yeah, time pieces throughout punctuating um, these drawings. And then on the wall you have the index which brings together another set of characters like the Lehman Brothers, um, Thatcher, Jeffrey Archer. And so you have a sort of market flow of, of those characters mobilized in the auction. Um, that are indexed on the wall here in CCA. Mm. <coughs> right. <laughs> um, wait, how do I start with this? Um, I think <coughs> this, I guess like c coming from the, the kind of, and it, actually it's not even start, but this, this ongoing body of work to do with the Marcos collection, um, I think it sort of reached a point where I got a bit like I felt like I was th this this collection was kind of closing in on me and and I needed to find a way to kind of because because I found these you know different strategies of 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 mapping these different strategies of actually of staging these narratives um but I I needed I I wanted to find a way of kind of expanding the kind of historical scope a way not just you know still having this kind of Marcos research as the nucleus of, of the project, but kind of, but trying to understand that history within a larger web of kind of complicity that um, that it, it it was it was part of. Like you know, the Marcoses could not have existed without the enabling power of um, of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, because they they were up until 1985 actually um, when when. The regime was perhaps at, it, at its most suppressive. Um, then Vice President George Bush went to Manila on a state visit, and on when he was doing his official toast for the Marcoses, he kind of he praised them for their commitment to democratic ideals, whatever that meant at that time. Who the fuck knows? But but I think but but this this trying to trying to establish this network of 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 complicit characters, this network of complicit political alliances, um, seemed like the next kind of way of kind of, I guess, expanding the context of this history, but also kind <coughs> of moving it away from, and I found it really frustrating when, because I was a Filipino artist dealing with Filipino um, history, people couldn't, couldn't quite see it, that you know there are al allegorical elements to that research, it wasn't just a question of identity politics. Um, and I think it's, it's something that as, as an artist who isn't working within his home environment, it's, it's a kind of pigeonholing that will always take place. And, and I'm, 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 I guess I'm fine with that. <laughs> but, but, it, but I think this, this, this body of work in particular was a way to kind of, to, ex to, move, to move further from that and kind of elaborate on why why this body of research on the Marcos had to exist, because it was part of a, an even larger network of problems, problems that, you know, that, that we're kind of, we're only realizing the repercussions of these particular decisions, that, of these particular conversations that these characters had now. Like we're living through, through I guess, the ruins of their decision making. Um, mm -hmm. So this, this body of work, which again is an ongoing, ongoing series, um, largely because, um, oh, sorry, just to just to preface the work, it's again, it's it's using the auction as a site of, of excavation, and it's actually it's, it's objects bought, sold, sequestered, laundered, whatever you call it, um, uh, from 1991 to 2015. So 1991 was the auction of royal silverware um, that the mark that were sequestered from the Marcuses and sold by Christie's, and then it moves on to 
September 29, 2010, which was uh, the uh, Lehman Brothers auction when, 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 when they went into administration in 2008, the, the administrators requested that the, that, the, um, that the collection be auctioned off. And the crazy thing was, the, I, sh I should have actually shown an image of it, but the, the cover of, of the Christie's <coughs> Lehman Brothers auction was 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 uh, an image of 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 the trading floor when it was about to you know about to implode but the idea of that being like a an attractive sale image who knows why that decision was made mm. but you know hmm. and then it moves on to 20, 2011 which is a, a Jeffrey Archer um, sale of his collection which which allegedly he sold off his collection to kind of to assuage his wife Mary, who obviously had to live through the embarrassment of Archer going to prison for perjury. Um, and there was also, the day before that, there was a Jeffrey Archer charity auction um, where the handbag that is referred, that is shown in the exhibition was sold. Um, and the, this particular connection of Jeffrey Archer to charity is quite peculiar because he, he set up uh, a charity <laughs> for uh, Iraqi Kurds, um, I think in the early 2000s, and claim that I think he oh, he th there was there was some dubious accounting to how much money the charity actually made and how much money maybe he kept for himself. But you know Archer has always been slippery with numbers. Um, and then the the 20, 2012 was the auction that of uh, uh, Elena Nikolai Ceausescu's uh, collection of domestic objects, uh, which was billed as the Golden Age. And then 2013 was the first Christie's auction in mainland China. And 2015 was the Mrs. Thatcher auction in Christie's. So these seven, yes, I can't remember, six, six auctions then kind of all these objects in the drawings are from these six auctions. But, but the reason that I want to continue this work in particular, because a week after this exhibition opened, Christie's then held a, a sale of the collection of uh, Nancy and Ronald Reagan. So it kind of just missed it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it means that, you know, this kind of, I, I, I don't know what, what, what it means about suddenly having access to Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher's personal lives at this particular moment when we're we're coming to terms with the decisions that they've made that have kind of affected us all um, terribly. Um, um, where Can was I? Can we do I? closer readings? Yeah. Of, because that's something that, yeah, I, I found is quite important as well. Mm. Of like, Just if we, can I? Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Yeah. Like what, what are the kinds of um, sort of semiotics of or mm. a sort of grammar of images that that gets built up um, within these drawings. Mm. Well, I think going back to, and I think it's always I never work out when to mention this, but but the title of the works mm -hmm. is is always crucial in how in how these works are made, obviously, and and the title of this series of work is also the title of the exhibition, um, which is Notes on Decomposition, um, and I'll kind of come to the. Mm -hmm but just to set it up. Um, and it's Notes on Decomposition is a kind of more accurate translation of a, of a book um, that was written by the Romanian philosopher Emil Siran um, uh, called Presia Decomposition. And it's actually, it's, uh, it's translated in, into English as a short history of decay, but the kind of provisionality of Notes on Decomposition uh, as my own translation of it seem to resonate more with with how I understood the text and how I kind of wanted to appropriate the ideas behind the text mm -hmm. into the work. Um, and I mean, if, if you get, if you ever come across the text, it's really interesting because it it was written by Siran when he was in exile in Paris, I think. And uh, it was at the end of the Second World War and the beginnings of the Cold War. So at this particular scene where people were kind of recovering from you know, from from such historical trauma and then still coming to terms with the kind of power structure that was going to come, that was going to follow. Um, but it talks a lot about the kind of the dangers of ideology and the kind of 
the tendency of people to commit historical amnesia and the kind of, in a way that the danger of an individual that can kind of inspire such terror. Um, but there's there's a particular quote from the, the, the text that I found really quite relevant uh, to the show, but also to the situation we're in now, where he, he says that a, civili a civilization evolves from agriculture to paradox. Between these two unfold the combat of barbarism and neurosis. From it results the unstable equilibrium of, of creative epochs. Um, the, the text itself is, is like a series of aphorisms. And, and I, I kind of, I was attracted to the idea of, of you know, of, of the, the, the structure of the aphorism as a kind of brief statement that tries to kind of contain the universe in a way. And I kind of wanted to, to somehow find a way to translate that structure mm -hmm. visually. And I saw each drawing as a sheet as a kind of, as having a kind of aphoristic quality in that each sheet of 12 objects then contains a summary of, of this sort of history from 1991 to 2015. And there's, there, there's a huge element of kind of, I guess of, uh, what's the word? Um, I've lost it. <laughs> uh, th there's a huge element of, um, of intuitiveness in how the works are, how the objects are juxtaposed and a lot of kind of formal considerations and, and a certain element of kind of visual play, obviously, like with mm -hmm. this one where you have, where you have the kind of the unmoving sort of hairsprayed sort of bonnet of Margaret Thatcher next to the kind of I iconic sort of swirl of, of Warhol's Marilyn. But I think there are these sort of games that I started playing with my s with with myself in, in, in sort of playing with these compositions mm -hmm. really um, and then it again it's it's uh, this 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 particular piece where you have uh, a desk ornament of of oil barrels um, made in silver cast in gold with little diamonds on each one um, which was uh, something that adorned um, a Margaret Thatcher's desk and then just adjacent to it is another desk ornament from Nicolae Ceausescu's table, which had the uh, the map of Europe on on one uh, on one side was uh, Romania, and on the other side was uh, was a was a set of bombs. But I really like the the kind of what was it the 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 the, the, the description of the the piece in the auction catalog was. A desk ornament representing Romania's achievements in the struggle for peace and disarmament. Uh, okay, um, but again, yeah, there mm. are these sort of gentle juxtapositions that that maybe that you you <coughs> you kind of clock when you see the work, but then perhaps when you spend more time reading the kind of over elaborate text, then you mm. kind of these these relationships are are even like further solidified. Mm -hmm. um, just chose a few kind of things that I found. So there's the Lehman Brothers sort of sign, which was, which went for like a few thousand pounds, I think. And and this is, this one is a particularly interesting one. It's uh, it's called Untitled. The the art object on the on the bottom of the the image is it's called Untitled So Delight Pillow by Marina Abramovich, and it was owned by the Lehman Brothers. And I think. Uh, Marina Abramovich kind of envisioned it as like the, the person who owns the piece would like rest their heads on on these these sort of mineral pillows and the energy of the stone would flow to to their heads and into their core and the idea of the, these bankers in sort of Canary Wharf like lying on these these Marina Abramovich designed sort of mineral pillows something <laughs> I kind of yeah I sort of I, I kind of wish it, it did happen but it probably didn't um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so there's mm. always like there's a you know, and there's also like suddenly you have the sort of blacksmith next to us, you know. So there, there's always like plays in like visual consonances, mm -hmm. but also in the kind of sort of different narratives contained in each in each in each object. Um, us? Yeah, oh, perfect. I actually want to go. Yeah. Okay. The flag is good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I actually only sh uh, saw the, I, I'd seen photographs, of course, but I only got in uh, to see the exhibition this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah, I, I think I, I had sort of misinterpreted the way that it would feel to enter and, mm. and, and view this flag. I somehow just had, had thought it would it, I read about it and I saw it, but I just when I when I when you see when you enter and you see the flag here, it's sort of, it becomes to me like sort of a curtain, like a theatrical curtain. It in a way it's also like a sort of this red flowing barricade, and it's yeah it's much more scenographic mm. um, than I had expected. And uh, we also talked about how um, this the the sort of au the auctioneers gavel um, is is also um, the same as the one used by the judge in court and the way that it it can easily perform um, as a call to order and I feel that the flag itself is is in that sense also this this kind of call to order mm. perhaps and again it, it it reveals the sense of disenchantment um, in this kind of luxury ex uh, excess uh, but it, be, but yeah, it also can easily operate as this sort of legal sonic object mm. that is is sort of tapping and and telling you, announcing what is going on mm. in our midst, and um, also this sort of inverted champagne glass in a sense. Um, it it sort of reminds me of these sort of slow motion advertising shots um, of of. of spray, uh, yeah. Yeah, of, of the spring, sort of the endless flow um, of of this golden uh, liquid, but then it it also is pretty much like um, the sort of seeping of oil or another kind of resource that that is flowing in, in this mm. inverted um, cup. So, yeah, I, I I really feel again it's it's the third flag that mm. you've produced yeah. and it would be nice to talk about the way that you look at these symbols. Yeah, I think I kind of, I mean, I, when, when, when I was, when I was offered to do the show, asked to do the show, I kind of, I knew that um, I wanted to start with, with these, these flags that I, uh, this is the third series, the third of the series. I, again, it's, it's an on, it's a continuing series where this, the kind of socialist, um, um, you, play, you know, it's a game of substitu substitution and substituting the kind of s this format with with different objects that kind of corrupt corrupt the kind of the objects that you associate with this with this particular kind of symbol. But at the same time, it kind of this idea of corrupting the symbol seems like a more potent sim potent kind of <coughs> way of. Of representing this particular ideological stasis we're in, where uh, so like this this state of interregnum, where these these two opposing ideologies seem to kind of just merge together into a kind of into a kind of a state of kind of unproductive kind of confusion, really. Um, and so, over the course, like this is the first one I did, which which still had the kind of the s the, the farmer's sickle. In, in this is part of the gasworks show, but in in the in the CCA iteration, the, any any vestige of the worker is complete has completely been replaced by, you know, by these sort of like shiny um, representations of excess. Um, and I really wanted to open with, with in a way like a, it kind of operates as a logo for the show mm -hmm. in a way to kind of, to begin to understand. Or to begin to set to set the stage for this sort of this elaboration of disenchantment through domestic objects, um, um, yeah. And I think the amazing thing about having this much space to play with is you can literally this the sense of it being a curtain that you 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 literally you flow through the space and and every every room there's a singular object that confronts you or at least a singular sort of body of work that allow that that kind of there's space for them to kind of to kind of fully express what they are or something mm -hmm. like that um, but also like I think crucially like the format of the flag is important because it it isn't it isn't a flag in in the sense of like a national flag which kind of flows in the wind it's it's static and it's angular and it, it's actually it's the format is more tied to the flag brand flags that you see on shops and Bond Street and 
and in a way that leads to, I guess, the, the final sort of strategy that mm -hmm. I use in my work at the moment, which is this kind of idea of like replicating commercial goods mm -hmm. to sort of talk about histories that, m that are involved in their production, but they m may or may not be immediately visible when you're confronted with these, I guess, these decorative accessories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, which brings us to, should I carry on? Yeah, yeah. how are we doing for time? How are we babbling on? <laughs> Okay, good. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and I think, so, how do I start? Well, basically, yeah, this idea of, like, of, of trying to use domestic goods or decorative accessories to kind of communicate these, again, these talking, go going back to the sort of the Croatian naive paintings and the text, these kind of combining these unexpected juxtapositions and realizing that they do kind of, they do make sense together, and historically, that they do occupy the same space. Um, and I've, I've been working on a series of, of wallpaper patterns, uh, of wallpaper based on camouflage patterns over the last um, few years. And this is the most recent iteration in a show in Sydney um, earlier this year. Um, and it, it, it's called 105 Degrees and Rising, which was um, uh, supposedly, which was the the code that the, the Americans used in Vietnam as a signal for the American army to evacuate Saigon. Um, and and the, the camouflage kind of is interrupted by another image, and it's actually your face. I don't have a detail, but your face with this kind of abject sort of, when, you, when, you're, when you're kind of quite far away, you see the kind of camouflage patterns. And this is a particular camouflage that was used in the jungles of Vietnam. Um, but when you get closer, it becomes like this sort of like this enmeshed like composition of like teeth and hair, and 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 it's actually the the imagery is taken from this iconic Farrah Fawcett poster from 1975 um, of her in the red swimsuit with kind of hair cascading, um, and I I kind of I found it interesting that these two kind of opposing representations of America were actually were taking place at the same time. So as this poster was like, was kind of colonizing the kind of popular imagination of kind of sun-kissed Americana, this particular camouflage was literally colonizing the, the jungles of Southeast Asia as, as the war in Vietnam caught on. So this kind of using these two kind of images, but also using kind of camouflage as a structure for abstraction, as a structure for, crea for creating something abject seemed like quite important and also kind of um, containing it within wallpaper is is key as well because it I think as, as we go through these these different works what what kind of what I keep on going back to is as as I kind of discuss you know sometimes like quite tangential histories what brings it together is the kind of the viewers kind of ergonomic relationship to to these artworks, so it's wallpaper, and then there's cameras, or so we'll, we'll kind mm. of progress. Yeah. Um, we can talk about this later. <laughs> um, and so again, this idea of camouflage, the idea of, of of decoration as a way of kind of making something more abject, mm -hmm. and kind of <coughs> rather than camouflage as a military tool for disguising things, it becomes a tool for making things more apparent. Mm -hmm. Is something that that is. Uh, it's quite obvious in, in this series of CCTV cameras that I've been working on, again for a few years, called decoys. Um, and s the seashell element goes back, to, goes back to the beginning, which is Imelda Marcos kind of using seashells as well as a bamboo as a kind of key element of her kind of visual style, but also as, uh, you know, imbuing it with a kind of political potency. So the idea of like, of creating these CCTV cameras that don't actually work, but kind of as these kind of corrupt observers mm -hmm. and these, they're kind of failed, f they're, they've failed in, in disguising themselves mm -hmm. and now kind of elaborately flaunting that failure. And they're, they're kind of, and these are quite, 
it's so unusual, and I, I do struggle to talk about these because they kind of don't really exist in a particular historical context, but they, I kind of, I display them randomly mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in a show that they just kind of, they sit there kind of oddly sort of human in a way and kind of just quite Yeah, I feel like they're kind failures. of these technological extensions of the body yeah. in a sense and this sort of, um, I also, I, when I see them, I also feel it's, it's, a, it's almost like a material comment on something like Adolf Luce's ornament and crime, yeah. right? It's sort of where Luce is sort of, I was thinking about it today and I was the thinking... The ultimate act, the ultimate criminal act. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but here it's a, uh, where he was afraid that ornament would make objects obsolete in time rather than retaining their sort of pure essence and value and um, the, 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 the kind of development of the modernist subject. And here you have these surveillance cameras that are sort of the ultimate um, kind of technocratic subject that are, that are covered up mm. and costumed into the seashells. And I think that that sort of commentary also takes us back to this particular time mm. in a sense of someone like Adolf Loos sort of being mm. able to make those comments and being kind of completely mm. criminally colonial about how he talked yeah. about this. Um, I think I think that's probably yeah. a good segue to mm -hmm. the, the the next series of works, which is that's another view of but the kind of this kind of interweaving of criminality, ornamentation, mm -hmm. and colonialism um, is obviously as is a thread that runs through the whole practice. Um, but this is this is a series of silk works that I've been working on for the again, like I keep on saying that phrase, but these works all exist in parallel. Um, but initially, these kind of works, um, they're all called Every Tool is a Weapon if you hold it right, which is, uh, which is taken from Hart and Negri, uh, an epigraph from Hart and Negri's um, empire. Um, but this idea of, like, of, of remnants um, then becoming kind of decoration and these remnants of quite painful histories in a way that these, these, kind of, these works developed, were developed before the drawings um, mm -hmm. in this in this show but but they kind of and in a way the the kind of the use of silk was away from me I mean I was I was kind of reluctant to show drawings for the longest time because I felt like I always had to filter them through another material mm -hmm. that kind of had its own historical baggage but but I think uh, I don't know whether it's just coming to terms with sometimes that this the simplest act is the most poignant, but the, the idea of drawing was, this is, the f this is my first drawing show in, in almost a decade because over that time I've been trying to kind of filter it through different surfaces. Mm -hmm. And this is how the silk piece, pieces came to be. It was trying to find ways to kind of, I guess, load drawing with historical baggage. And, and, and forensics. And, and forensics and, and yeah, so carrying on from that like this is another silk piece which the new th this new work that I've been working on which um which kind of uses the Hermes patterns more specifically um and kind of uses certain compositions within the Hermes archive to talk about more specific histories rather than this kind of broader broader mm -hmm. narrative um yeah. yeah, and I also feel like there's this this kind of um, embodiment and this sort of performativity to these pieces because mm. they can be, they sort of seduce you to be worn, to yeah. be carried away. Yeah. Um, and again, they, they kind of corrupt the subject that is wearing them. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, takes us to the handbag, yeah, well, which is the last piece which in is the, the last show. Piece, which is the, yeah, so, oof. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, when I, I didn't know anything about it, we covered <laughs> so much ground, sorry for overloading you. Um, when I saw these, again, just as image, um, I started to think about how many kinds of economy are covered within this practice. So you have this, this economy of the luxury good mm. that then circulates in an informalized network of um, of selling of markets of flea markets of markets on the sidewalk, the temporary market in which you can bargain 
So value fluctuates in a different order than it would in the auction, mm. but it does fluctuate um, dramatically. If you're smart, you know you have to bargain and take away your, um, you know, kind of branded product that is made by um, by uh, leather mm. um, artisans in in a in a in a market that would then sell within the the sort of store mm. stores of um, some of the most expensive streets in the world. Um, and, and yeah, I think this coexistence of, of dramatically diverse economies is something that I feel is, is an mm. important part of talking about labor as well mm. within the practice. But in a way, like, like yeah, I keep on talking about this, l l this idea of labor kind of is, is very much present throughout the show. So there's, there's the, the flag as a kind of symbol of like, of labor as a kind of failed polit political ideology and then there's the idea of creative labor as um as 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 shown through the drawings and then the finally is this idea of like labor as a kind of geopolitical reality i mean i've always i've always been kind of drawn to to this idea of like of how histories are contained within a single object i mean precise particularly because you know in the context of of the philippines the kind of the very difficult history of the philippines has been always been kind of reduced to imelda marcus's shoe and and I kind of found a consonance with that to to you know this sort of the phrase handbag this sort of as 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 a kind of talking about how someone's been overpowered politically by Margaret Thatcher and the kind of the reduction of, of again quite a, a turbulent history to a to a single often gendered female accessory is is something that I, I kind of wanted to exp I knew I wanted to explore and and the kind of the political climate during that that presented itself during the show, but also the space allowed me to kind of to fully realize that with these handbags, which kind of attempt to map Thatcher's ideology with kind of Jeffrey Archer's flair for theatrics at auctions, with with a kind of less grand history of of leather production in the Philippines. These were all made in in Marikina, which used to be. A thriving leather industry, um, but has now um, pretty much has been in constant decline, largely because the Philip, when the Philippines joined the World Trade Organization in '94, the the influx of, of 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 imported goods, but also the kind of the 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 transfer of production from places like the Philippines to China, then kind of killed the industry. So. So in a way, it made sense to kind of end the show with this sort of like quite stark funereal, but also oddly sort of glamorous object um, that kind of attempts to contain, literally contain all of these histories into into singular objects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and yeah, we covered quite a lot. <laughs> That's sort of where we decided to end. Yeah. That's um, yeah. Maybe we should yeah. open up to questions. Um, for yeah, we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone has anything to say, I, and I'll give you the microphone. Um, if not, I'll ask something. Mm -hmm. um, I also thought just what we were, you were just talking about there. There was a quote in the essay that you wrote for Eflux for as part of the show. Um, that and I'm not sure who who wrote it, but you were quoting. So I think you were quoting someone that mm -hmm. said, "Corruption begins where visible labor becomes invisible." and invisible labour becomes visible. In this corridor, it acts out and re-enters the body politic as a sentient character, passing the stench of capital from body to body. And it, I just thought that was quite nice for this show and for that work mm. in particular. Um, I'm not quoting anyone that's Is it you? It's yeah. really nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the way it's sort of uh, structured in the mm -hmm. essay, it looks like, but yeah, mm. it's nice. Um, but yeah, I, g I guess I've got one question. Well, I've got a couple of questions, but we'll see how much time we've got. But the one I wanted to ask was uh, something that I'd asked you just as the exhibition opened, mm. which was about um, women and how, and be because it's maybe something you've not talked about quite so much in this mm. uh, presentation. Um, but it's to kind of talk about uh, or a, b a bit about how you choose or, or how women seem to be the focus of many of the works. Mm. Um, and or pe or women who hold some kind of power within the discourse of your practice, um, so you've got like Thatcher and Imelda Marcos, and um, within some of the scarf pieces, there's the Italian photographer, oh yeah, Gina, um, and yeah. uh, 
Bo Derek in the um, Dazzler show four or five years ago. Um, and also some of these objects that are associated with fashion and glamour. Mm. Um, and you've talked a bit about the handbag being a weapon um, because Thatcher mentions or it describes it as that. Um, but I just thought maybe now you've had a chance to think about it, it would be nice to kind mm. of but see I think what you I feel. I guess, yeah, I think, I think we had that conversation. And I think the kind of beginnings of it is really comes back to political, to, to when I when my political political consciousness was developing, it was it was at a time when the binary kind of figures in Philippine politics were Imelda Marcos and Corazon Aquino. So you had these like, you know, the kind of extravagant, glamorous lady versus the pious, sort of simple individual. And it's sort of it's a kind of it's a dichotomy that kind of has still informs Philippine politics. So on the one hand it's 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 that, but on the second it's also this kind of there's there's always an element of being seduced by the objects that I, that I tend to reference and, and, and this interest in material, this interest in, in kind of on the surface of things. Um, for some reason, it always is more like, is more kind of apparent in, in objects like silk scarves or handbags. And so there's, there's that, but on, on, on the third hand, it's, it's this like I was just reading um, already reading this this Guardian piece a few weeks ago about like trying to kind of basically talk about Theresa May through the kit and heel, you know, this sort of like constant kind of reduction of these female characters into like an object, which which I think doesn't really happen. You know, you don't talk about David Cameron's tie as a kind of defining aspect of his leadership. But this like, this kind of almost violently like forcing a whole complex historical being into one thing. Um, for some reason, I always seem to encounter it through these gendered representations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe the, the show at the Duchy then was one of the first times where you tried to create that link between a female character and an actor and someone who's in the, the very present, very visible yeah. in popular culture and trying to connect that to a wider discussion that might then bring up kind of a discourse on the male gaze and why w mm. how that's come around or I don't know. Um, but yeah, does anyone else have any questions? <laughs> it was a very thorough <laughs> presentation. Was, yeah. um, Maybe, yeah, maybe, do you want to talk about the previous work or how do you feel? No, I think, yeah, I think the Dazzler show, I think, because obviously it's the last piece I did before the show, but I think it was, just going back to that image, but it was kind of crucial in terms of how, because this was the first show I've done Bef before this exhibition in 2012, I was sort of, I hadn't really shown for two years because I was trying to work out how to kind of, how to place these interests in decoration, in corruption, how to put it into a, con a real world context, quote unquote. Um, and it was really useful in, in just trying to m work out a way of strategy of making um, and, and the kind of, the, w the use of archival material. It, it, so it, it was kind of seminal for me in a way. Um, and it's, it's definitely kind of shaped how, how I approach sort of the space and how I approach kind of the kind of how insanely organized I am about like crafting an exhibition in the way that the way that the exhibition itself is is, is a material in it's it's a it, you know it's it, the way that the, the exhibition is kind of structured is as much a kind of material that I play with as as the objects themselves so that makes sense um, yeah yeah, and it was the first time that you brought all these kind of disparate elements or tried to talk about disparate cultures and connect them together in a space. But also to present sort of convincing, to, to literally map it. Like there was a behind, in the back room, there was a, there was a map that kind of linked Bo Derek with, with dazzle ships, with the use of uh, dazzle guns in Iraq. So there was this kind of, 
there was in this intent of kind of literally making, forging these links between these disparate histories mm. um, through the exhibition, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you talked about that being very kind of formative for mm. this show and for how mm. you've, how you're, you're now working, because the, the Marcoses weren't really in that show so no, much. No, I think that happened like, I think a, a year later. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if I could ask a question, I'm sure I haven't put it together as a question, but about maybe to follow on what you were saying about the idea of labour, mm -hmm. and then maybe sort of, but as well as the idea of labour, because that obviously points towards a certain sort of understanding of work, maybe this idea of investiture or manifest effort or sort of, and maybe you, to sort of speak directly, I suppose, about a return to the use of drawing mm. and the kinds of roles with which I suppose I've seen quite a lot of the work over a quite long period of time mm. from, you know, undergraduate work, but it's um, it's maybe with, it's there, a, it's there different kinds of labour at play within the work. Mm. And, you know, and I'm wondering whether or not the kind of sort of laboriousness of the drawings relates to the sort of, the kind of uh, commissioning of something like a handbag, you know, and now to the, the laboriousness invested in that. Mm. Whereas actually, you know, you could take the same taxonomy of objects insofar as they're presented as postcards or as photographs, but then they would actually have more or less the kind of same attitude that it sort of replicates the attitudes which collected them mm. rather than the, ab the attitudes mm. which fabricated them. And I think, mm. I wonder, is, is that sort of, I mean, I know that's, I'm just trying to work out how to sort of, is that sort of something that's changed your sort of attitude between this sort of almost a managerial strategy and a kind of... Mm. But in a way, that sort of managerial strategy was what led to a kind of, a, re a return to this sort of, this kind of, to, to the simplicity of a process really, because I think I wanted, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to go back to this idea of like transforming the objects to a kind of, turning it into a kind of penmanship of my own. Um, I don't know if that kind of, and that kind of answers the question of, or whether it just kind of elaborates on it. But yeah, it, it was definitely a decision that, that I kind of took on for this project in particular. That I, wanted, I wanted a return to that kind of labor over the kind of the, these, because over the past few years, it has been a series of commissioning, of labor as an act of commissioning. And I kind of, I felt like I needed, like just from my own, um, I guess, personal kind of reason, but also maybe it was a way to kind of, to kind of, re-engage with the studio as a site of production, um, particularly because I was producing this work at a particular moment when uh, I think I was having quite difficult, I was having a really difficult relationship with the political kind of narrative that was, that was unfo unfolding as the work was being produced. And it was kind of, in a way, maybe a drawing became a cocoon from from the in, from the uh, outside the studio, but also it became a way of dealing with it in a very specific mm. method. Yeah. Maybe then the room is tired, and we can uh, we can chat more more over the bar. <coughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember what I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you <laughs> for the exhibition and for the talk and for the conversation, which was, you know, deep and broad ranging and, and diverse, of course, um, and kind of did bring to the surface a lot of the research, which is mined and, and written as well. Mm. And I'm glad you mentioned the writing and so on and the textual. And I was thinking about restorative justice and the gavel what you were saying mm -hmm. about the you know the uh, going under the hammer and the hammer of justice and the gavel and the value of these kind of abstract content uh, concepts which are kind of manifest uh, uh, or embodied uh, in objects mm. or the absence of the object or the silhouette rather mm. You talk about them as drawings, mm. I see them as silhouettes. Yeah. And that sense that they're there and not there. You're only seeing the shadow 
of the former substance, which is still veiled. Mm. And somehow there's a, you mentioned dramaturgy and uh, the, the fake, you know, another word for the fake, I can't remember what it was, but, but I thought it was counterfeit. Mm. And so there seemed to be a kind of counterfeit restorative act. Like we're getting the objects back, but we're not getting them back. Mm. Mm. You know, so it's a counterfeit justice mm. in mm. a sense. And it's not it's not your task to restore justice to mm. the people. Mm. If you like, that's democracy's task. Mm. In a sense, and I, I think that leaves that kind of thing. It leaves the space absent for us still to organize. So that's so it's not a question, Peel. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> It's a kind of an attempt to arrive at some phrasing, an appropriate phrasing, mm. in response to the experience mm. of the inventory as somehow being a, a presentation of, you know, the the, the absent object, mm -hmm. saying this is what has been lost, and then the silhouette of what has been mm. lost, and so on. They're all um, effigies in a way, yeah. Y y precisely, and it's that sense of the counterfeit being maintained in the very process of trying to articulate it as, mm. as a kind of surrogate. So that's all. In it. But but I thought there was something that along those other those notions of collections and retribution or restoration and the you know um, restitution of of objects from you know like Garlitz collection and so on mm. being restored and those kind of acts where the, a, a notion of justice is at stake. So it's no longer an abstract concept, it's an actual thing that has to be restored to mm. someone who formerly owned it. Although these objects have been bought and sold by ill-gotten gains, but we're not finding the person who, from whom they mm. were originally. So that's not part of the, the final justice. Mm -hmm. There is something suspen in suspension, because mm. we're not asking where the object should have had gone to. We're, asking, we're really talking about the the mediators mm. of the objects and the profit and the, collect the collection, and then the auction house. Beyond that, we're not really, you know, it's a, br a broader notion it's of the good, public or the people is concerned. So there's no, the, the true owners are not really identified and so on. And that's what I think mean about counterfeit mm. uh, restoration or restorative mm. counterfeit. And not in a negative critique sense, but more in a kind of positive open endedness mm -hmm. of it. So it remains alive and there's a dynamic space that you enter all even though it's empty. Mm. So yeah, that was that was it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great way to end. Mm. I feel like you've summed up something really important. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and thanks to Natasha and Pio as well. Um I should also say that tomorrow night we've got a screening. It's the last event in the uh, exhibition programme and it's a really amazing um, Filipino film. S s people describe it as one of the best. It's like a social realist sort of classic. Yeah, uh, it's called Manila in the Claws of Neon and it's uh, going to be here tomorrow night at 6.30, I think, and it's free and um, you should come along to that because it's going to be really nice and Pio's going to introduce it. Um, I am, okay. <laughs> or <laughs> I can do it if you want. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you very yeah. much to both um, for, for being Thanks. here. Thanks for coming. Thank <laughs> you.